the studio with New York Times best-selling author John Gilstrap. Good morning. Jefferson County Prosecuting Attorney Matt Harvey. Good morning. And uh, it is the birthday of one John Grisham, born this date, 1955. What are your Ooh, thoughts that on hack. What do you think? What are, your, <laughs> what are your thoughts on your fellow best-selling author John Grisham, Mr. Gilstrap? Actually, I have never met John Grisham. I understand he's a very nice guy. Um, he certainly <laughs> inspired me uh, early on. Yeah, it, cool. it's, yeah. I, I thought the. Um, the Firm was the first book of his that, that I read. and it Tom was, Cruise movie. And I thought it was really spectacular. And he's done really well since then. <laughs> Do you think he's read any of your books? Uh, he may cool. be a big fan of yours. I, he, he, could, he could very well be. I know that I have heard from, because he's, he's John Grisham, I'm John Gilstrap, JG, and books are on the shelves alphabetically. I've heard from probably a dozen people over the years that bought one of my books thinking it was a Grisham book and then say, but <laughs> but I really liked it anyway. So, so, so was, you owe him a royalty check so, potentially? No, no, no. He wouldn't. I could give him my entire annual salary and it would be less than his royalty check. So, <laughs> Mr. Grisham. Now, anyway, he was uh, born this date, 1955. Some other big names this day, too, uh, going back in time uh, from the Honeymooners, Audrey Meadows, 1922. Uh, one of the great actors of all time, Jack Lemmon, uh, 1925, uh, known for The Odd Couple, the movie, not the TV show. And then uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, was one of his last great movies, I think. Just, it's a marvelous film. Uh, that's uh, Jack Lemmon. James Dean, 1931. Uh, Nick Nolte in 41. And uh, 1940, Ted Koppel, who I never heard of before the Iranian hostage crisis. And then Ted Koppel started doing a show called America Held Hostage Day 1, Day 2, all the way up through, and eventually became Nightline. Yep. And it's still on the air as Nightline today, but Ted Cobble started that during the Iranian hostage crisis. And how many total wow. days were there? 400 and... 444. Right, 444, right? Yep. That, that was the number that's, that was on my mind. And do you know what Jack Lemon's tombstone says? No. It says, Jack Lemon in, and then there's the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen it? I've just seen a picture of it. I don't know if you've been there. You've been a lot of places in person, so I don't know if you've actually been to it or not. Via telephone, the Vice Chair of Finance, Delegate John Hardy. John, good morning. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Awesome. How about yourself? Good, good. Um, just, uh, you know, session is starting to pick up and been, uh, just kind of getting the swing of things. Did you get a good shot in on Hornby <laughs> yesterday when he was doing the speaker for the day thing? I saw him up there as the speaker, and I was terrified. <laughs> Were you the one that made the motion to vacate? Fear, fear overtook me. Fear overtook you. Well, the democracy survived, sir. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. No, he he did a great he did a great job. Roger is uh, uh, is a great guy, and he likes to give people opportunities. He's given me an opportunity to <clears throat> just run some meetings when we would do the uh, remarks by members uh, later in the day, and and uh, so you know, Roger's a great guy, and uh, Hornby did a great job, and. Uh, He's like the rest of us down here, just uh, working and trying to keep everything, uh, uh, trying to stay on top of everything. You know, it's the time of year where things are picking up and uh, bills are starting to move in committees. And uh, uh, we, we haven't started seeing Senate bills yet, but we are starting to, uh, you know, move some of our stuff through committee and floor work is picking up. And so it's, it's, uh, it's just that time of year. And before anybody texts me, by the way, yes, I do know it's a representative republic, not a democracy. Uh, Mr. Hardy, I was instructed to ask you about the SRO bill by Mr. Hornby. What do you got going on there? Yeah, so, you know, I've got I've got a, quite a few really interesting pieces of legislation this year. I, I felt like I'm really kind of thinking outside of the box this year. So this SRO bill is uh, 5197, and, and this bill is a little unique. Um, we didn't – there was an audit that was done by the State Board of Education – uh, for their security programs, and, and they were asking for about $180 million. But within that um, breakdown, there was about uh, there was two line items there that totaled about $28 million to have a real and meaningful SRO program. So I kind of took that $28 million and ran with it. And um, so I, I kind of did a little bit of research and figured out through falling enrollment. So if we if we would just take the money that we put into education the last two years, we kept that funding stream the same. We have a fun, we have a falling enrollment of around 5,340 students with a total of 245,000 and some change in students. Um, we can take that money from falling enrollment. And, and what this legislation does, it really does not cost the taxpayers any money. It really doesn't cost the legislature any money. It's money that we've already previously allocated towards the uh, school aid formula, but due to falling enrollment, there's there are monies available. Now I don't know if there's enough 
we're still running the numbers to see if there's enough for the entire 28 million, but there's there's money there. So that's the the unique part of the funding formula. And then the other part of it that I think is kind of unique is you take that 28 million dollars and you give that 28 million dollars out of gener- out of out of the general revenues so it would be pulled back from school aid formula and go back to general revenue and then is directed to the auditor's office. The auditor would set up this program. The auditor would set, put up the board. There, there would be a board put in place. Um, there, the fund would go to the auditor's office, and then this would work as a grant mechanism. So uh, it would be based on student population, distances between schools, and, and what other other criteria that the board may come up with that would define uh, how these SROs were uh, divvied out you know, to, to state schools. And your county commissions would apply to the auditor's office for this grant, uh, and it would be an 80-20 grant, so the auditor's office would provide 80% of the funding for the law enforcement officer, and that would pay for the salary, retirement, um, training, equipment, uh, everything that the officer needs, and then that that money would be passed on from the um, county commission to the local law enforcement, to the to the to either the sheriff's department and also municipalities could fall for this for schools that lie within municipalities. The reason I did that was, is I believe in my heart of hearts that if we are going to protect our children in our schools, we need to do it with law enforcement officers. We need to do we need to do this with people that are trained law enforcement officers who have been trained in these scenarios. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of giving the gym teacher a gun. I'm not a big fan of these guardian programs because these guardians have absolutely no authority to do anything. Um, they, you know, they, if they touch a child, they can be held liable. So I think that if we're going to protect our children and protect our children to the best of our abilities, that we need to spend the money to put trained law enforcement officers in our schools. I would concur. What's what's valuable to you? Everyone has to make that determination. What What is of value to you? And if it's not well, our children, and, what is it? And, yeah, and some people are concerned about how I'm – sending it to the auditor's office. But the, the problem is, Rob, sometimes, and I'm not here to bash anybody, but I, sometimes money goes to the State Board of Education, falls into a black hole of abyss, and the legislature has not a lot of oversight on how things work over there. And, and I don't want them taking that money to try to develop their own programs. I believe that these are programs that, that need to be run by our local sheriffs, our local police departments through our municipalities, and we put trained law enforcement officers in our schools. John, one of the concerns the schools have, and talking with Superintendent Ron Stevens, is that if there is a police emergency, then that sheriff can be diverted from the school to something else, leaving the school without an SRO. And we know that there are scams going on every day that pull resources in one direction uh, and... and, uh, that way it creates a diversion for something else that bad that can happen where those police were removed. So uh, if you could address that, if you could assure schools that sheriff's deputies would not be diverted away from a school when there's an emergency otherwise, I think they would be less inclined to want to develop their own program. Sheriff's deputies that are SROs are being funded through a grant for SROs. So I think that that gives a little bit of security right there that that the, the bulk of that money is coming from the program for them to be SROs. They are dedicated to be school resource officers while school activities are in play. So uh, I'm not sure what this, what Berkeley County Board of Education's, um, w- what their plan is to use guardians or they want to use, you know, uh, retired military people. I'm not sure what they want to do. Um, the guardian programs concern me because now you're putting a civilian in a school that really has no authority to do anything, no, really no authority. I mean, they're there for probably what you'd say worst case scenario. I think when you put a law enforcement officer in the school, those law enforcement officers become embedded in that school. They can head off a lot of issues and problems before they get started. Um, you know, they're, they're basically a, not only a law enforcement officer, but they can become a counselor. They can become a confidant. I'm um, not saying that that couldn't happen with the Guardian program, but I'm just saying school teachers are school teachers and law enforcement's law enforcement. And that's, that's how I see it. 
I had a neighbor who was an SRO, and he knew a lot of stuff about the school, and he got to know the kids, and he was the person everybody went to and knew. So uh, SRO done well can be a valuable asset to any school. John? I'm just wondering, <clears throat> you're right, I mean, teachers are teachers, and, and, and law enforcement's law enforcement. Um, to get, what does an SRO do, God forbid, or, or thank heavens, which way you want to go to it, you know, we don't, this is not an everyday occurrence that somebody's coming in and tearing up our schools. So as a career position, year after year, um, as you envision, is the SRO essentially a beat cop walking down the hallway, or does he have ancillary duties, or how does that work out? Otherwise, it would be really a boring job. No, well, I, I mean, I think it's it's not a job that it's the same officer year after year after year. I mean, it could, obviously, it could rotate. It could rotate. You know, just because it's a, a position, the position could be filled by one, two, or three people. It could there could be rotations involved. You know, there may be one SRO for after schools. Uh, um, there, there could be you know for after school activities. There could be one for daily activities. I mean, obviously, there's you know there, there's there are there are uh, kinks that are going to have to be worked out. But this is the first step. More, moving forward to try to keep our students safer than they are today. I can't guarantee that we're keeping them 100% safe, but it's, it's a lot better than what we're doing right now. And especially, I think Berkeley County is, we're fortunate. You know, I think we have an SRO in every high school. One's provided by Martinsburg City Police Department. The Sheriff's Department is providing maybe three or four others. Uh, but in a lot of these counties, they have no protection in their schools. So, um, and, and here's the kicker, here's, here's the kicker. If you take that $28 million and divide it by the students in the state of West Virginia, it's $114.24 per student. For, to protect that student better than we're protecting them now for an entire year. That's about the cost of a basketball uniform. Good so point. what happened to the – there was a bill that was advancing early in the session, I think there was, that was essentially allowing teachers to, to be armed within the school with training and such. Is that still in consideration, or is that – Dead. No, I'm, that bill is still, uh, for all purposes, it's still alive. I don't know where it goes. I don't know where it's at. It's probably sitting in judiciary. Um, I'm not saying that that bill won't pass either. I'm, I'm just saying I'm trying to pass my piece of legislation mm -hmm. to try to do what I feel is the best way to protect students in schools. And God forbid, let's let's think about this. No, West Virginia is. We we have all this talk of how we're changing and we're becoming more proactive and not reactive. This is a, 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 a perfect opportunity for us to be proactive and not reactive because God forbid something happens in one of our school systems and then well, now we have to come down here and we have to be reactive because we didn't address this when we had the time and the ability and quite frankly the finances to address this. Matt Harvey. Good morning Delegate Hardy. Um, we, we tried to get this out of Mike Hornby a little bit earlier, but we I'd like to hear a hot take on on the governor's debate from the legislator. If well, well, first of all, I'm finding it hard to be your friend that, since you don't drink milk. I, I think that's really weird. I think that's, I think that's I just really think weird, Matt. You're not, it, Are you lactose intolerant, Matt? No, I just it's just, this is a choice. I mean, I, I I I don't know. I don't I don't drink it. I don't I don't think it makes me sick or anything. It's just what? it's just gross. That's fine. It's drinking another species of milk that was intended for its, to nourish its child. <laughs> yes, you're killing baby cows. You're oh. hogging, you're hogging all the milk. Not a big sausage fan either. Then <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll eat I'll eat meat all day long. That's different. I don't know how that's different. <laughs> yeah. I just cut up on the governor. My, my take on the governor's race is it's all over the place. It's all over the place. I mean, I I don't think it's as much tribal or in or or um, based on you know where you live or where you're from or zip codes. It's kind of all over the place. I I spoke to someone who is a and I'm not going to name names, but I I spoke to someone who's a very has a very powerful position and and down here and believes that Chris Miller's going to win. And I spoke to someone who. You know, that's not from the Eastern Pan. You know, one says, oh, Patrick Morsey, this is a clinch. I mean, he's, it's his race to lose. And then you talk to people from, you know, the Charleston area and 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 maybe areas a little north. And, oh, it's more Capito's race. Can you uh, – no way, Moore's got this, you know. And then and then there's a small contingent for Mac. And, I, you know, I, I think the more that Mac is on TV and in debates, 
the better he does. I mean, I, I've, I've had conversations with Mac. He's a, he's a friend of mine. Matter of fact, I'm friends with all of them. I think they're all qualified in their own ways. I think their personalities are very different, and I think their approaches would be very different. Uh, but I told Mac, I said, you know, the more you can get on the TV in front of the people, the better you do, because I think he does a great job. But but uh, I, I'm staying completely out of the race. I, you know, I, I, I think that um, – I think who I think is going to win the race, but that, that my opinion is probably not that important, but uh, yeah, it's kind of all over the place. That uh, I listened to the debate and there were, there were some jabs. There were some barbs that were thrown. Well, let me ask you this. Chippy. At the end of that debate, uh, Mac Warner's camp released a press release saying that Mac came out of there known as the education candidate. Would you agree with that, Matt Harvey? Or is that gloss? He bring, he. That's his issue that he's campaigning on. Yes, so I I would agree. Would agree. With that. Okay, good. That that's the issue that he focuses on more than the other candidates. John, you're you're not going to run for re-election in the House of Delegates. You're going to run for County Commissioner. Your phone your phone's kind of zapping on me here a little bit, by the way. So I'm not sure where you are in the Capitol. I know that reception oh, can be cellularly dodgy. Uh, but it, we had uh, yesterday on the program Jim Whitaker, Eddie Gokenauer was here, Gary Wine was here. Uh, among the things we talked about in various segments included the county's finances. And uh, right now the county needs to find a little bit of money. Uh, the COVID money's all been spent. And uh, there are still increasing costs in Berkeley County as a growth county. One of the things they're hoping to get done with their lobbying efforts in Charleston deals with property taxes. And that would be as in real estate uh, property taxes, not personal property taxes. And the whole rollback provision in regards to the increasing property values versus the assessment rate, John, what are your thoughts on that? Because uh, some might interpret that as a tax increase, a backdoor no, tax support, increase. No, no, I support that piece of legislation and have supported that from the get go. That that rollback is really a very, very antiquated um, piece of legislation that was put in in the 70s, uh, really back when assessors were not doing a good job of assessing properties and then there was some statutes put in that made the assessors do a better job of doing the assessments but there was some legislators that was afraid that that would become freight train and could get could get out of control and to be honest with you that rollback i'm staying completely away from it i'm not sponsoring it i'm not really speaking to it because i, I don't want it really does affect the growth counties more than it affects other counties um and i don't want people to get the impression down here that I'm running for county commission and this is something that I'm trying to achieve to, you know, to help Berkeley County as a growth county, but it really is a very antiquated type of rollback and uh, it really is detrimental to counties that are growing um, and you can lose that revenue uh, quite quickly and be, take a very long time to regain it. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of getting rid of the rollback. No, I don't know if we can make everyone down here understand that i'm sure that if the powers to be and i'm not sure who that may be that doesn't want to get rid of that could easily manipulate that piece of legislation to say well you're giving your county commissioners the ability to raise your taxes and you're really not uh, it's all it's all based on really an antiquated formula so no i i do support that piece of legislation i i think that county commissioners should have the ability to raise your taxes because they are the folks who are locally answerable so if you don't like the fact that a tax increase went through you can vote them out and vote in somebody who wants to roll taxes back. Uh, I think controlling that at the legislative level in Charleston removes what Republicans should be for, which is local control, John. Well, yeah, and we, and we're, we're, we are for local control until we're not. I mean, we've been bitten quite a few times where we've given local control, and it's went amok. I mean, it's, it's went awry. I mean, so there, I mean, I understand that. Now, I'll, I'll be, hopefully I'll be successful in my county commission race, and I'll see it from the other side. And I may be down here in a year or two, you know, uh, fussing that we need, you know, ways to generate more revenues. But as of right now, I'm, you know, I'm a West Virginia state delegate and I'm trying to run a fiscally conservative budget and trying to not raise taxes and trying to be able to uh, impede on our citizens as little as possible. But the, the whole idea, and I know we've had this discussion before, but the whole idea of local control is it's local control. You take the good with the bad because it's local control. It can't be just local control that I approve of. Then it's not really local control. That's it's like if your daughters, when your daughters are adults, John, and they go out and make their own decisions, and you go, okay, well that was a bad one, so we're gonna we're gonna take that house back from you. 
That's true, but you can still be there for guidance. You know, you can still be there for guidance. <laughs> yes. You know, I, <laughs> but you I can't be like making their decisions <laughs> for them. Well, it's true. This is true, but I feel like we've given local control to our local school boards, and they've not done what we thought they would do with that local control. So, you know, and, and I'm saying, you know, the county commissioners are duly elected officials. I understand that, and they we've given them oversights on health departments, and, and we, we've given a lot of that to them. So this is just one more step to take for the rollback, and I think it's a positive thing. Does it pass? I don't know. I think it, I think it buzzes through the Senate. I think there's no problem with it in the Senate. But in the House, things tend to get a little convoluted um, when it comes to dealing with county issues. Well, and <clears throat> let me be the, the devil's advocate here on, on local control. If, if politicians have the opportunity, no offense here, if po- politicians have the opportunity to spend other people's money to gain votes, they will do that. And so by giving local control to the counties and giving them permission to raise taxes, it's just it's a commission meeting and and you do it early in the term, you get it done and it, it will it won't be held against you. But I think the, the greatest way to make an area more expensive is to allow politicians to be able to raise taxes on their own. Well, you know, and that politician is a general term, not this politician. No, 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 and I don't, I don't mean that. I mean, just <laughs> this is a referendum where the voters would, right, exactly. of the I mean, county the would choose years, whether. I've done everything I can do to cut taxes, control spending, uh, and I'm expected to do the same thing if I'm elected to the Burford County Commission. You know, I'm going to uh, be a budget hawk. I'm going to look at our budget and see exactly where the money is spent. Uh, I feel like the county commission has done a good job and are, are, is doing a good job. But there's never, there's always room for more oversight. I believe that if you give the the county commission the ability to tax, they will tax. I've said that in the past. Uh, I think the bill with having the referendum built into it makes it a little bit more appealing. I, I, I have openly said on this radio station and others and in public that I did not support the one percent sales tax at this time. Uh, putting the referendum in it makes it a little bit more appealing. It makes it so if uh, your constituents want to pay for services, then they are, have the ability to pay for services what makes me very nervous about that though is that it's, it's a, every six years it comes up for re you know re-election and what if you have put i mean budget 101 is base building with money that's not going to be there so i mean that's that's a pretty scary you know if you've got six years in and you've built a police force a fire department and an ems and some other you know some other things that you are now on the hook for and in six years, $11 million, $12 million goes away. I'm not sure how a county recovers from that. John, on that note, we have to end our segment. Thanks so much for calling in today. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Vice Chair of Finance Delegate John Hardy at 957.